Hello friends, welcome to our Geocam series once again. Uh, I'll be talking on synthetic and antithetic force. If we consider a simple um, passive margin uh, setting, uh, in this case, uh, we have an unfaulted block A and a faulted version of it B. Uh, behaviors like this, uh, in this case extension, can be driven by you know sediment um, loading within the basin. Uh, of course, bearing in mind that the flexural strength of the rock materials uh, vary from one rock material to the other and also vary with depth and uh, of course the rock mass is not homogeneous uh, our dear earth of course is not homogeneous as you go from a surface to a deeper intervals it kind of changes in this rheological uh, or um, rock physical property now consider a, a scenario where um, you know we have simple uh, normal faulting uh, on both cases, figure 1 and 2, uh, what's common to both of them is that we both have uh, simple synthetic force. But one thing that is different is that for figure 1, uh, we have a case of post-depositional faulting, and that of figure 2 is seen uh, depositional uh, faulting. And that's also telling us a lot about when the faulting happened, uh, whether it happened before or during the sedimentation. Now, in this other scenario, uh, Two, uh, we have a similar case of, you know, seen and post depositional fault. But the difference here is that we now have the opposite um, set of faults, uh, which in this case is the antithetic fault. By the way, if you have a, a, geo a geology stand on this location or anybody stand on this location, and um, you know what what you see is the fault dipping away from him. This major one is called the synthetic fault or uh, listric fault but the one dipping towards him in this in this uh, in this case uh, opposite uh, the synthetic fault uh, that would be this other fault is called the antithetic fault now the key question is what triggers synthetic and antithetic faulting um, where, where do we find them and why why is it that in some cases we have just synthetic fault or listric fault why in other cases you have both synthetic and antithetic fault that's what we will attempt to answer in this discussion now a bit of background i mentioned earlier that the rock uh, property uh, changes uh, with, with with depth the, that's the rheology which uh, would be the the, uh, the physics of the rock deformation of earth deformation that changes with depth uh, and then the substrate again and when i mean substrate i mean the rock uh, mass below the fault so if i have a simple fault like this uh, in this case, uh, so whatever I have below this fault, it could be mud, it could be evaporite, uh, is what we call the substrate. And um, so like I mentioned, it could be mud, it could be evaporite. And another thing again is materials can behave in a plastic manner or sometimes it can be non-plastic. So plastics and uh, carbonates and um, um, you know, other salts, they all behave differently. And it's all a function of the intrinsic property of the rock itself. And the, another one other key thing, again, to note is the relative rates of false slip and uh, sediment loading. Uh, so they both interact, and the interaction between the both of them actually drive the formation uh, or the behavior of this force. So what I mean by that is if I have, um, let's say, a simple case like this, Right of synthetic faults, um, the fault slip will be will be the, the the distance between here and this point. So this would be the rate of fault slip. That would be yeah, that's the rate at which uh, the the offset between the hanging wall and the foot wall are changing. On the other hand, the rate of sediment loading will be the rate at which sediments are coming from you know, wherever it's coming from, uh, the source, and being deposited on the hanging wall. So in this very case, what we see is a case of a listric um, or synthetic fault, or simply because it's curved, so it goes from very steep angle at the surface, at the shallow depth, and as you go deeper, it gets uh, more, less steeply dipping or less less inclined. Uh, so again, one, one thing we're trying to mention here is Materials behave differently, especially uh, plastics. They are very brittle at shallow depth, and it becomes plastic as you go deeper. 
and the behavior, the difference in the behavior at different depths actually impacts the fracture um, angle or rather deformation angle of most rocks and that changes with depths and that is part of what drives the curvilinear uh, nature of Lystric faults. Now, for basin scale uh, Lystric faults, one key thing, like I mentioned earlier, is the interaction between the rate of false slip and the rate of sediment loading. So, in the first case where you have, you know, both sediment loading and false slip keeping, uh, you know, some kind of pace with each other, not a lot of difference. That means you don't have a um, lot of changes in the rate at which sediments have been loaded onto uh, the basin or on the hanging wall. And also the rate at which the fault is, is propagating downward is not really you know, changing so much. In that case, there won't be significant growth. In the other scenario, where the rates of uh, sediment loading far um, is far greater than that of the fault uh, slip, you're going to have significant growth. And again, what you will see will be that the um, the list of faults will, you know, have a very rapidly changing uh, behavior as you go deeper. It gets very flat as you go deeper because of rapid loading onto the uh, basin. Now, for antithetic faults, it's uh, slightly different. So in this very case, we, we, we're looking at a scenario where um, what was originally a normal electric fault now kind of has an opposite pair to it, right? So supposing we have, uh, in this case, uh, a particular unit A, right, being deformed along this, you know, red fault, which is a electric fault. What we notice is that across the fault, it's thicker, that's right here, which kind of makes sense because it's, in this case, it's a growth fault. And one other thing to note is that on the surface, you know, indications, uh, imprints like this on the surface are probably fractures or joints. And this, with time, can propagate and eventually develop to become uh, new faults uh, by themselves if the deformation continues um, in this area. So again, like I said, if you focus on this uh, angle of the fault, this is typical of what we see. Now, going down to the propagation or the formation of um, antithetic faults, uh, so consider, a, 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 let's say, a preliminary or an early stage, uh, in this case T0, where we don't have a lot of deformation of the rock of the stratigraphic units, uh, but what we see as we go from T0 to sometime later in the future, or yeah, much later, which was which is T1, uh, we see that the unit which was originally uh, sub horizontal at T0 had become curved during time uh, T1, and that's because of the growth, or rather, the, the, the you know, curvature that we have at that's time. So what you notice is that the distance, or rather the length of this stratigraphic uh, unit, um, A1, B1, right, is eventually becomes greater than its new length during a time T1, that's A2, B1. So by then, uh, what now happens is that because the unit has become curved, it's been shortened at time T1, and that, that, that kind of sets up some other action at the other point, A1, which I'll be talking through in the next um, slide. So, yeah, so what happens here is that as the rate of sediment loading, right, continues to outpace that of fault uh, slip, right, we're going to have growth. And as the growth continues, you're going to have a curving, a curving of what was an originally sub-horizontal um, layer. And as that continues, at this point B1, originally point B1 from at the initial time, that progresses to become 
a new location because the unit has become bent. So it goes from point B1 and it goes further down to B2 at the Listrick fault. Now, what that does is that it sets up some kind of stress, right? Opposite of this Listrick fault on the other side where you have A1, which I've highlighted in, in the circle. So as this uh, unit continues to you know, fold, forming this rollover anticline, it kind of exerts some stress or pull at the opposite location, uh, A1. And that means some of those original fractures which we had, which we had seen in the previous slide, will eventually develop to become active faults just opposite of where you have this district fault. Now, if we continue with this uh, line of thought, what it means is that as the loading continues at this, um, you know, area, just in front of the district fault, this uh, first triangle, as that continues, this amount of space or curvature we have for this unit will increase, and therefore we're going to have more shortening of the original rock. And as that continues, this original, this uh, area, in, in which is A1, which was originally a simple fracture or a joint be and had become an active fault, continues to develop and propagate downward. So as the loading continues in, in, on the side of the electric fault to your right, you're going to have more pull at point A1 on your left and then more folding or bending of this, of this layer and as that continues, you're going to have this unit move from point A1 and it's going to move deeper, uh, thereby generating this line along which the anesthetic fault uh, eventually forms. So if we, if, if we continue with this thinking, that means anesthetic uh, fault is being triggered in this case by shortening of the original rock mass. And also, you can also extrapolate that to mean by stress or pull opposite of the point where you had loading. So now, this, this is just another way to look at it. So through time, from time T1 to time T4, for example, we have the rock uh, unit, the point A1, uh, B1, right here. As loading continues... At this, on this location of the uh, Listrick fault, on top of the hanging wall, the point of intersection between the top of the rock mass uh, and, and the fault plane continues to move, you know, continually downwards as the unit continues to, you know, bend. And in the same vein, again, on the opposite of it, the rock continues to shorten on the other side, uh, opposite of the Listrick fault from A1 and uh, all the way down to A4, you know, it's just in response to the behavior on the side of the district force. So through time, you notice that uh, as you go from A1 to A2, all the way down from A3 to A4, the trajectory that the deformation uh, takes on the opposite, uh, you know, antithetic part of this, uh, the, uh, of, uh, of this um, deformation uh, is covilinear. So in summary, um, antithetic and synthetic faults kind of, happen in pairs. Uh, synthetic faults uh, are originally driven by behavior, rates of sediment loading, and rates of false sleep. But synthetic faults are actually uh, you know, driven by the rates of deformation you have on the point of the electric fault, uh, and that drives how much of uh, you know, the behavior of the electric fault and how much of propagation you have as it goes further down. So thank you very much. Uh, this is what I, I have for now. Uh, this is all my idea for the, in terms of the behavior of electric faults. Uh, please, I'd like to get your feedback and your comments. Just uh, don't hesitate to send me an email. I'll be glad to respond.